For AntiWar.com and Chaos Radio 95.9 in Austin, Texas, I'm Scott Horton. This is Anti-War Radio. So the big news is that Karl Rove is putting out a book or has put out a book saying, yeah, we lied you into war, but it was an accident. It was bad intelligence. We never would have done the war if we didn't think that Saddam Hussein was stockpiling weapons of mass destruction. And so rather than letting him get away with that extra lie piled on top of the previous pile of lies, I figured um, I would bring Larissa Alexandrovna, the managing editor of Investigative News at RawStory.com on the show to help me with a little bit of revisionist history here. Welcome back to the show, Larissa. How have you been? I've been good. Thanks for having me. Well, I really appreciate you joining me here. So uh, you tell me, is Karl Rove right that they accidentally lied us into war? No, he's a liar. Karl Rove was the chairman of the White House Iraq Group. Uh, the acronym is WIG. Um, their sole purpose was to stop the war to the public. Um, all right. Well, so what indications do you have? I guess let's start in chronological order. Uh, who wanted regime change, and, and when did they get started on pushing regime change in Iraq? They they wanted Iraq even before Bush got in the office. And we know from um, Bush's Treasury Secretary, Paul O'Neill, that day one in office, they were looking for a way to go after Iraq. I mean, they already had the policy, you know. This is not something new. They were trying to find ways. Even on 9-11, the first thing was not to determine who actually attacked us, but how to tie this to Iraq. We know that from Richard Clark. Um, we know that Wolfowitz and uh, Paul Wolfowitz and uh, Donald Rumsfeld were busy trying to implicate Iraq in this. So they already were adamant about going to Iraq, but we also know from the Downing Street memos, which were um, notes uh, that of a meeting that the Bush administration had with the then Tony Blair administration, that they were going to, quote, fix the facts around the policy. So if you have a policy and you're determined to, to somehow use, you know, what happened to us in order to initiate that policy, and we further know that you're willing to fix information around that policy, that is to say, find intelligence, cook it, whatever, that's not an accident. It, you, it, I mean, it's impossible to call that an accident, you know? And, and and so many ways that they messed up. I mean, how many ways can you take the wrong intelligence over and over and over before it lo- starts to look suspicious? All right. Well, so now let's get into some of this because, you know, despite what uh, – well, I'll tell you a story, actually, to, to set up the rest of this. I know a guy – who uh, I hadn't known him in a long time, and I knew him again, and I had a talk with him. And this guy was like, it was like reading Glenn Reynolds' blog for four years straight or something. It was like every single lie and every single bit of mis- and disinformation put out by the Bush government about what they were doing with Iraq. This guy had completely memorized and knew it as well as you know the truth, Larissa, and had this whole thing where, well, the weapons are in Syria and and just every little bit of it. So it occurs to me that that's kind of strange in the age of the Internet when for years and years in a row now we've known the truth. There's been tons of reporting uh, about the Office of Special Plans, for example, and the neocon cabal inside the vice president's office and the Pentagon and sure, et cetera sure. like that. So, But there are still people who believe that George Bush was basically right, but the Syrians got the mustard gas now or something well, to this I mean, day. There's people who believe that Iraq attacked us on 9-11. You know, you're never going to correct all the misconceptions, especially when Fox News and those kinds of outlets are working so hard to make sure that that misconception stays. Yeah. You know? Go well, ahead. so let's let's go through in detail about what these different accusations were. Let's start with uh, what Bush was ending with in uh, that clip from his Cincinnati speech from, I think it's October, November 2002, about the unmanned aerial vehicles. What intelligence did they have about that? Do they know they were lying about that? You know, I don't know if they know they were lying about that. That's a hard thing to answer. I mean, there are plenty of people who would say yes. Um, that's not something that I have direct sources on that I could say, you know, without doubt that, yes, they knew they were lying. It wasn't accurate, but they were lying. Also remember that in in um, 
I think February 2001 it was, we started massive bombings of Iraq already. So, right, you know, three weeks after Bush took the oath. That's right, that's right. So, and, you know, if, if, if there were these unmanned, you know, drones and this and that and the other thing, you know, why wasn't that brought up then? <laughs> well, and in fact, in the spring and early summer of 2001, Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell both gave statements on the record that anybody can find on YouTube. Maybe I'll try to cue those up here. Um, saying that, well, we have Saddam Hussein in a box and we've degraded his military far below what it was in 1991 and he doesn't threaten his neighbors and we're just going to keep containing him, basically. Well, it's not just him either. Everybody knew. It's not like, it's not like there was doubt. There was no doubt. Every reputable intelligence agency had warned us. Our own intelligence agencies have, has had debunked every one of the pieces of so-called evidence we had, whether it was the drones or the, the aluminum tubes, uh, the uh, uranium forgeries, the, you name it, our own people shot it down. And yet the Bush administration at every turn would look for that one not remotely credible source they could use to say, aha, but see, this is the intelligence we're going to go with. Right. And, you know, while the American people were telling each other, basically, you know, uh, doing their minor bird thing uh, from watching TV news uh, and saying to each other, well, you know, uh, the president has secret information that we don't know about. And so but we're sure he wouldn't just bluff and he must be telling the truth and whatever. In fact, it wasn't just the CIA who debunked the aluminum tubes. For one example, it was Knight Ritter. It was Jonathan S. Landay and Warren Strobel and the guys over yeah. there at Night Ritter Newspapers. And, in fact, even in the Washington Post, and this is something where, you know, if it runs on page A34 in the Washington Post, that's one thing. If it's the top headline that day on Antiwar.com, that's not up to their discretion. And so I remember in September of 2002, there was a whole run of stories, including even the Washington Post, that said that, Every expert at the Department of Energy, at the Bureau of Intelligence and Research, which is the State Department, CIA, intelligence agency, basically, and most of everybody at the CIA say that these aluminum tubes could not possibly be for centrifuges. Well, wait a minute. It's not just even that. It's, it's, it's the IAEA. It's British intel. It's MI6, British intelligence. It's German intelligence. I mean, it, it, it's really... Very simple. I mean, you have, let's say you have 20 people telling you that the earth is round and you've got one person telling you, well, you know, the earth is really flat. And that one person has a financial interest, let's say, like the, the curveball. Um, and at every turn, in every instance where you have 20 to one, you always pick the one. It's, it's really that simple. You know what I mean? They're, they're, it doesn't matter what how many agencies told them. It doesn't matter how many people knew. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. The fact is that the, at every turn, they chose to go with, you know, for the lack of a better term, the minority report. In this case, you know, the one. Right. 20 agencies versus international versus versus the one questionable source. And they did this over and over and over, and that's deliberate. Yeah. You, you may mess up once, but when you do something over and over and over and it's clear that you're constantly trying to choose something that will uh, fix the facts around your policy, then it's, it's clear that this isn't an accident, that you're deliberately manipulating things in order to, to write the narrative you need to go to war. Sure, yeah, especially when you're talking about things like the aluminum tubes that had been publicly debunked in the press around the world for months. What, six months, seven months before the invasion even started on the premise that, well, these aluminum tubes must mean that they have a nuclear program. I mean, that to me is especially outrageous when their bluff has already been called and they still use the same bluff. Well, I mean, hello, the, the, the IAEA uh, basically laughs at the Niger forgeries because they're such obvious forgeries, and yet the same month, we attack Iraq. I mean, the, the, the IAEA very publicly said, oh, my God, this is what you're using? To <laughs> yeah. say that they, you know, and, and they pointed out just how absolutely ridiculously and sloppily fabricated it was. And our response, we go to war. <laughs> uh, everybody, it's Anti-War either. Radio. I'm talking with Larissa Alexandrovna from Raw Story. Tell me, who's Ahmed Chalabi?
Oh God, he's a con man. He's a he's a, a an Iraqi con man. Uh, there's a lot of speculation that he's likely a double agent for Iran, and he, he basically he's one he's the one. You know where I was saying you have 20 agencies, and then there's one less incredible source. We used him, him him at every turn, and he was he was head of this you know right American right wing fabricated Iraqi National Congress. And well, isn't it the case that the CIA had basically given up on him and cut him off, and so then he went to go work for the DOD? And this is where we start getting into the neocon faction here. Let's talk about who right. these uh, American Enterprise Institute and Washington Institute for Near East Policy guys that ran this thing. Well, I mean, essentially, uh, during the Bush years, the CIA, uh, in my opinion, served the role of looking, uh, you know, basically taking the fall for everything. That was their only purpose, whereas the DOD actually engaged in what are usually CIA activities and and running that little show of extracurricular sort of illegal activities. Um, you had Paul Wolfowitz, you had uh, Donald Rumsfeld and uh, Douglas Spice, and above them calling the shots was Dick Cheney and David Addington and, and their cohorts in the uh, oil industry and such. So... Um, we also had Wormser uh, and Bolton over there at the State Department in the first that's administration. Right, right. And then later, uh, Dick Cheney's daughter, Liz, was sent over to play their role. Well, Liz was sent over to, to play with the money that, that was being doled out to terrorists on our behalf. But nobody ever wants to talk about that. I you do. Know, was, Are you talking about Jundala and MEK? Oh, yeah. She was running the little budget out of state for that. Awesome. We should uh, try to publicize that angle more. She's well, seeking I mean, political I power, you know? Maybe I'll make a bumper sticker. Liz Cheney funds terrorists. But think about this. What, what qualifies Liz Cheney uh, to run uh, uh, this type of operation? What? Nothing other than being the daughter of Dick Cheney. It's almost like a crime family. They, yeah. they, they All right, wait, wait, wait. We're skipping ahead, though. This is a whole yeah. other interview we're working on. Tell me about <laughs> okay. this. this. This is what Justin Romando calls the transmission belt of treason. Uh, Colin Powell, in fact, and of course he's trying to protect himself, war criminal that he is, but he told Bob Woodward that uh, the Office of Special Plans... Uh, the euphemism for the Iraq desk over at the Pentagon, that this is Doug Feith's Gestapo office. They've gone over there and they've created a separate government. And that's what he was talking about, right, is this neocon cabal yeah, I mean, ensc ensconced inside all the different departments. Well, right, that's exactly right. And, and later it would be transformed into the Iranian directorate, uh, from which um, they were trying to find a way to, you know, I, I think it, it was supposed to be Iraq and then it was supposed to be Afghanistan, Iraq and Iran, like boom, boom, boom. But we got so badly, uh, these guys got Iraq so bad and they were so exposed by their lives and all that stuff. They were unable to complete the Iran element of it, but they had already started working the Iran angle, you know, trying to tie Iran to uh, uranium smuggling, trying to tie uh, Iran to terrorism in Iraq against our soldiers. Um, even trying to tie Iran in some cases uh, in some plot with al-Qaeda against the United States. So uh, it's this one little cabal, and it's mainly a policy office, but they're using DOD resources um, to conduct operations that are not legitimately DOD territory and not legal for the DOD to be involved in because there are certain... Um, Requirements, like for example, the CIA requires presidential findings on some things, whereas the DOD does not. So they were running black ops that's usually CIA territory, and they were answering only to the office of the vice president, that is to Dick Cheney. So there was no oversight. Nobody knew what anybody was doing except for the small group of people. And, you know, some of these people are graduates of the Iran Contra scandal. So, I mean, they've already, you know, we, we forgot another player, Elliot Abrams over at the National Security Council. Ah, good call. Not forget him. Yeah. So, you know, we, you, you have essentially a very tightly controlled um, mechanism uh, that's conducting illegal activities, reporting to Dick Cheney, and working for a budget that nobody has oversight of, and, uh, you know, uh, actually cutting out every other agency that should be legitimately involved. Uh, well, I was going to ask you about uh, Ariel Sharon's influence here because uh, Julian Borger, James Bamford, and Robert Dreyfus have all reported that 
Uh, they had their own little Office of Special Plans over there in Ariel Sharon's office. I guess uh, they sort of had the same problem with the Mossad that, they, that the Americans had with the CIA, which was the lie but not quite good enough for our purposes. And according, I think, to Dreyfus's reporting, uh, actually to all three of their reporting there, they say that they were actually manufacturing uh, bogus intelligence in English for funneling into the same stovepipe here. Yeah, well, I mean, they're not the only ones. The Russians were also fabricating God knows what. Everyone's fabricating intelligence. You know, I the Russians it, were fabricating intelligence to help the Americans start a war with Iraq. No, 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 no. Oh. To, to, no. Their focus was to make sure that whatever happens in Iran, they had complete control over it. Mm -hmm. But I'm going off on a tangent. What I'm trying to say is that you've got um, essentially what I call intelli uh, an intelligence laundering market, and you know that's why you have experts review the intelligence coming in because you don't know if it's questionable who it's coming from and in all cases most cases you know and yes the the, the you know Ariel Sharon and, and and his little cabal is very similar to our structure here um, but it's not unusual um, because you find that in a lot of administrations look at Tony Blair same thing you've got MI6 saying no, 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 and Tony Blair saying, and his little cabal saying yes, 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 and right. then when it all comes out, he blames MI6, Cheney and Bush blame CIA, uh, Sharon blames Mossad, yeah. you know? Well, in fact, I guess Sharon didn't even need to blame Mossad because his role was never really that publicized, but uh, Anders in the chat room points out that it's come out at this Chilcot inquiry over there in England that there yeah. were Israelis at those infamous Crawford meetings where the memos about the, the Downing Street memos about fixing the intelligence around the policy came down. Well, and there were also Saudis. And the, the meetings about uh, the various meetings in, in Rome and in Paris um, that involved the, the Niger forgeries had uh, the Saudis, they had. Um, I think uh, Pakistani intelligence, um, the ISI, uh, and Ita Italian intelligence. That in and of itself, I don't know if that means anything per se. And remember, Israel is an ally of the United States. So Britain and Israel are both allies, so it makes sense that they're at the meeting. Um, I think it's not as damning as it can sound. You know what I mean? When you take into account that we were talking about allies, it's like uh, Britain and the U.S. had meetings with Polish intelligence, you know. And it, it, yeah, except there was no clean break paper written for the polls about how our first effort needs to be getting rid of Saddam Hussein. Yeah, but Israel didn't want Iraq. Israel always wanted Iran. They don't care about Iraq. Iraq was not a problem. Iraq was America's baby, not Israel's. And well, it does sort of seem like Sharon said, we'll help you lie the people into war with Iraq if you promise to hit Iran next. Well, that's why I keep saying that my, my opinion is that it was supposed to be a three, like a drive-by shooting kind of thing, one, two, three, you know. You hit Afghanistan, you don't finish it, you go to Iraq, you don't finish it, and you, and you know, each stage you declare victory, and then you go right to Iran. And, uh, you know, they were able to leave Afghanistan in, dis, in entire disarray because Afghanistan is already in disarray, and so nobody was really going to expose that as much as they were with Iraq, you know, mission accomplished. Why? What mission accomplished? You've got sectarian violence, you have all this stuff going on, um, you know, whereas in Afghanistan, it's much more like the Wild West, so it's hard to say who's fighting who, what's going on. Do you think that Dick Cheney and Richard Pearl and Paul Wolfowitz ultimately were the Ayatollah Khomeini's useful idiots? Uh, there was a CIA and a DIA report that came out that said that they went back over all the evidence and, and looking back over 10 years or something, they convinced themselves that not only did Ahmed Chalabi tell the Iranians, it must have been Fife or somebody who told him, uh, that the Americans had broken all their codes, but actually they think, as, as I think you said, a possible double agent, that he was a possible double agent that uh, maybe uh, lying the American people into war with Iraq was all about uh, Khomeini trying to get back at his arch enemy Saddam Hussein, and that America's war was really all about what the Iranians wanted. Well, I never mean, mind this, Ariel this Sharon very... or Dick Cheney or anybody else. They're well, just puppets been... on his string. Well, this is this is what I've been saying for years. You're talking about a chess player and a checkers player. You're talking about guys with a lot of hubris and very little understanding of strategy 
and and a complete disregard for uh, international laws and such. So by the very nature of what they're trying to achieve, they have to rely on really shady characters, okay? And they're not very good strategists, and they're but they're very arrogant. So they're they're the checkers crowd, and that's Dick Cheney and the head of gang. And then you've got Iran, <laughs> and they play chess, and they're very patient, okay? And they're very careful, and regardless of their you know insane uh, leadership out in public, the reality is he doesn't run the country. Um, they're very patient. They're very careful, and. From day one, I, I, I kept saying, if you attack Iraq, you are giving Iran a gift. And I think Israel was very much concerned about this as well, which is why they likely agreed to join forces on Iraq, provided that there would be no threat to them from the Iran side. So it, it's funny. I remember when people thought that Kissinger was um, a double agent for the Soviets. And it's funny now when you think that, oh, wouldn't it be interesting if Cheney and those guys really, you know, knowingly or unknowingly agents for Iran or the Saudis or, you know, any number of, I mean, look at all the people who benefit. It's not us. Right. Yeah. Well, it's everybody but the American people and the Iraqi people who benefit, it looks like. And, and maybe well, the Turks. And it's not Israel either. Israel's put in more danger and is under uh, more scrutiny now because, you know, there's misconception that it was Israel that drove the United States policy in Iraq, which isn't true. They were always interested in Iran. Um, so you've got Israel that fails. You've got Britain that loses. You've got the United States that loses. Uh, you know, but you but look at Iran the, and Russia, Iran, Russia and China. Well, I think wouldn't you agree that the Israelis actually did benefit from a stupid point of view? That is to say, a Likudnik point of view and that the largest single Arab state and, and would-be most powerful Arab state has been smashed. And even if the Sunni, uh, pardon me, even if the uh, Iranian-aligned Shiites uh, end up dominating the country, uh, they still mostly only dominate their part of the country, and I guess including Baghdad, but they don't control Anbar, really. And, well, and Iraq has because... kind of ceased to exist, wouldn't you say? Yeah, but but that's the thing. Iraq was uh, keeping Iran in check in some ways, you know, and by eliminating Iraq. Or yeah, but you're being smart. I'm asking you to be a Likudnik for <laughs> for the purpose of the, you know, because uh, you know I yeah, think I anybody know, would Likud agree that all of this policy is bad for Israel. Every single bit of it is bad for Israel. But that's not what Richard Pearl thinks. Is what I'm getting at. Yeah, but Richard Pearl doesn't work for the, you know, the Israeli government in terms of decision making. I think what you're talking about is. You have to remember that as, as powerful as Israel is, it is still a client state of the United States. And it doesn't have a lot of choices. If the United States says, look, we're going to war in Iraq, then Israel's going to have to be on board. But Israel can demand, and likely did, that if they do that, they have to ensure that they take out Iran, too, because then Iran's left standing as an a serious threat. Um, so I don't think they had much choice. You know, they are a client state, so they're doing what they're told by the, you know, colonial master, in essence. Yeah. Um, in terms of Iraq, not Iran. I, we were driving, or I mean, um, America was driving the Iraq train and Israel was driving the Iran train. So, but you know what I've always thought would be interesting is, you know, the really the biggest winner out of all of this is Russia. And it's beautiful irony if you think about it, I, it, the way it works out. We defeated the Russians by getting them stuck in Afghanistan. Yeah, well, now, I mean, it would make, they've, they've just, <laughs> I've always argued that it would make perfect sense if our entire political class were a bunch of KGB agents. I just, I don't really see the the proof of the connection, but it, I, no, I but guess I wouldn't Russia. be surprised if it turned out that they were all a bunch of traitors. Well, I mean, you know, I'm I'm vehemently anti-Putin and his gang. I mean, violently, vehemently. You know? And th the thing is, if you look at what's happened, it's remarkable. You've got a totalitarian government in Russia that's looking like the most beautiful democracy. has got the world respect. Putin is the sane one. And here you have what would legitimately a democracy look like. The Soviet uh, what, Union. 
Yeah, and we are, have lost all the money. We've lost our our military has been incredibly degraded. Our country's falling apart. People are in poverty. We're becoming the Soviet Union. And to me, like if if <laughs> if I was Russia and China and I wanted to create a new bloc and destroy the United States, I would create a trap in the Middle East to do it. You sure. know, and. Yeah. This is part of why I've always said, you know, I, I almost wonder if the Russians aren't involved in some of this really elaborate, you know, siphoning of, you know, funneling of intelligence and such. Well, they could be, but, you know, I mean, if I was Vladimir Putin, I'd probably just be sitting back and laughing and, and keeping my my hands out of it. Uh, but, really? But you you're certainly be- right that... That, uh, you know, America's losing and that's good for any potential adversary. And you're also right that Russia looks good in comparison only to the United States right now because of what our country's been doing around the world. Well, and more importantly, Russia controls oil now more so than it's ever controlled in Europe. All right, wait a minute. Now, I want to wrap up this interview with a couple of more points about how Bush knew he was lying. And these are the names, Naji Sabri and something, something, Habush. Uh, well, wait, wait, let's be I careful. Have it here. We, don't, we don't know if Bush knew he was lying. We know Cheney knew that he was lying. Whether or not Bush knew anything is, is not something we have any, you know, one way or another, any proof of. Well, we have uh, what seem to be at least credible stories about uh, George Tenet explaining to uh, George Bush, that he had flipped and, and turned Iraq's foreign minister, Naji Sabri, and uh-huh. that he had verified that they had absolutely nothing and that the CIA had vetted, Tyler Drumheller uh, told this uh, story, that they had vetted the hell out of everything he said, and this was credible information. They don't have anything, Mr. Bush. And then it turned out that they also had flipped uh, this guy, Habush, uh, or the Brits had flipped this guy, Habush, uh, yeah. who was there, George Tenet, was Iraq's head of intelligence, who told the Brits the very same thing. Right, but, okay, now, you have to remember who we're talking about. You've got George Bush, who is inherently not going to, he, he's already, like, entering office knowing that he's going to distrust the agency. So George Tenet, and he's a Clinton layover. So Tenet tells Bush this, and what do you think Bush does? Bush meets with who? Who do you think he likely meets, likely meets with? He meets with Cheney. the National Security Council. Or Cheney, Rumsfeld. Elliot Abrams, Rumsfeld. So you've got one guy that is tenant, and then you've got Rummy, Cheney, Abrams, Wolfowitz. Um, you see my point? And they say, well, no, you know, they just don't want to, uh, you know, they could. Bush isn't such a capable thinker. He's not educated in terms of military history or strategy. He's not. He's going to think. Okay, this is what Tennant tells me, and he goes to uh, probably find out if you know. He's not someone that's going to. And like, if if you try to pull this stunt with, let's say, with an Obama administration or with Obama, you breathe him. The chances are the guy's going to know something about what you're talking about, especially uh, if you consider the Biden uh, factor. Biden would be able to very clearly know what was BS and what wasn't. Bush, on the other hand. He was not remotely qualified to be president. And so my guess is no matter what was told to him, I guarantee you he went and discussed it with Cheney and his National Security Council, which were all Cheney's gang. And who knows what they said. So we don't know if Bush lied, knowingly lied. We do know that Cheney knowingly lied, but we don't know if Bush knowingly lied. And I think we need to be very careful there. I mean, yes, he's an idiot, but did did he actually knowingly lie us into war? I don't know. Well, yeah, I think I think it's clear just from going back to all the statements that he made, as you pointed out, long before September 11th, saying we are doing this. And then when September 11th sure, happened, sure. then they said, oh, well, in fact, here's a lie where he knew he was lying was was they would ask him. This is what uh, Colonel Sam Gardner called the excluded middle, where they would ask George Bush, why? Why Iraq? And he would say, because of September 11th. But, uh, right, but you've but, got uh, Cheney but, uh, telling but, uh, him. Because it changed the way we view the world, and now we see. But he would give you that giant pregnant pause where you would just fill in, oh, because Saddam did September 11th. 
And he no, knew but, that that you know, was what? manipulative and that he was trying to buffalo the American people into believing that Saddam had brought those towers down. Look, I'm no George Bush fan. I mean, it, that would be hilarious if somebody actually suggested that. But let's be let's very careful here. The, the reality is he's parroting, just like he's too stupid to understand that when he's told you've got to repeat something to catapult the propaganda, he actually repeats catapult the propaganda. Right. <laughs> you know? Look, I'm not going to sit here and argue that he's too smart to be innocent in the way you describe. I, I concede your point. Okay. So what the guy's was clearly dumber than dirt. Yeah, and uh, that's why, and uh, maybe that's and why. And clearly he didn't care if it was true or not. He that's was right. getting his I would thing agree with you on well, he right. was busy praying to God, and so he thought he was in the right because, you know, Jesus was on the side. Of course. Everybody knows that. Right. All right. Um, I want to get to one more lie, which is uh, that turns out he was right. It's the cover of Newsweek this week. Yay, victory. Purple ink on fingers, just like 2005. And George Bush was right after all, as Thomas Friedman wrote in the New York Times yesterday. It's a good thing we liberated those people. You're kidding, right? I, di I didn't see that, but you're kidding. Are you kidding? Oh, no. Yeah, never mind the deaths. We'll let you know, historians the worry Soviet about the Union. deaths. No, no, they voted in the Soviet Union, too. That didn't make them a democracy. <laughs> yeah. It's well, not who votes, we it's vote who counts here. the vote. <laughs> As Stalin said, it's not who votes, it's who counts the votes, okay? Let's, yeah, exactly. I don't need a, you know, a purple finger to, to tell me that, that somehow we've delivered a democracy when that's entirely untrue. Well, if you haven't seen the cover of Newsweek this week, it's Bush walking off set, off stage, off set is really more like it, from the deck of the USS Lincoln in his mission accomplished speech. And it's right. saying mission finally accomplished. It all worked out in the end. Yeah, and what was the mission? Can somebody tell me? It's like they're looking for something that looks successful and they'll say, okay, that was the mission. <laughs> because as this was happening, nobody knew what the mission was. I'm pretty sure that the mission was just taking those pallets of cash from the Federal Reserve and running. Okay, I tend to agree with you on that. And, and uh, also, uh, you I'm know, just jealous, uh, though, because I wish I had a pallet of cash. I wish I had a bailout. But that's, you know. <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is, think about this. For the entire presidency, nobody knew what the mission was, right? And yet, they see something positive and they go, aha, that was the mission. It's, it's accomplished. Yeah. Well, why couldn't they tell us that was the mission all along? <laughs> yeah, well, it makes perfect sense, and maybe we ought to just follow the Tom Friedman model ourselves and leave no, all the no, bad I, parts I, I, of the historians I, to worry about, and maybe we should just declare victory and go. The problem is we, we don't have the luxury of allowing the historians to fight over it because there is so much propaganda that it's impossible to – everything's become opinion. Like, facts are debated as though they're opinion. No, the earth is round. No, the earth is flat. Yeah, after all, Bush, in his uh, exit interview, said, look, we had to invade because Saddam would not let the Iraqi inspectors in. And Charlie Gibson said, wow, yeah, I guess you're right. I don't remember what 2003 was like, so if you say so. And then right, that was even it. Though they were, they, even though they were there. I mean, what I'm saying, as long as you can, you know, you're talking about a very lazy, in some cases, uh, more sinister type of media. You're talking about an attention span for the public that, you know, uh, American Idol is basically the longest thing they'll watch. Um, and you're talking, you know, so it's very easy to sort of change things now so historians have a different perspective. Like, look at, have you seen these billboards people are talking about where it says, do you miss him yet? And it's Bush. Yeah. Yeah. And nobody knows who put that up, but suddenly, you know, people are using those billboards as, see, we do miss him, even though if, if, <laughs> if <laughs> it's like me saying, okay, take a photo of me, put it up, and then have someone go point to it as proof of, you know, that people miss me, even though I'm the one who put up the photo. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was his friends at Clear Channel, who, of course, are the ones who made him a millionaire in the first place when they bought the Texas Rangers from him. <laughs> Well, in any case, what I'm saying is I, I don't think in this day and age where everything is being allowed to stand, where all you have to do is apologize, and but the record isn't corrected to the point where people still think that Saddam Hussein attacked us on 9-11, yeah. you know? To the point where even I got to sit here and scramble and send emails and make phone calls to try to remember the names Sabri and Habush. 
Well, even if you don't remember the names, you do remember the facts. You know, you don't have to remember that, you know, what number President Abraham Lincoln was to know that he gave the Gettysburg Address. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? You don't have to remember every detail, but... but I do, uh, but you're right. Yeah, I see what you're... As you just pointed out, the whole Gibson interview, the, the fact that Bush is allowed to say that as though it were fact. Yeah, well, even uh, at, while we were talking about the John Stewart thing and the, the torture interview the other day, and... You know, even John Stewart, who I really like, he gets all his news from TV. So when he and he's really smart and he remembers the things that he saw on TV that are important, but he doesn't read antiwar.com. If he did, he would he would have kicked that guy's ass. You know, I bet he kicked his ass anyway, though. Well, he did, but he did. But man, if it if he was a regular reader of Glenn Greenwald's blog, it would have been an entirely different interview, if you know what I mean. Yes, yes, I agree with you. But, you know. He is a comedian. He's really not. <laughs> You've got to cut the guy some slack. I, I will say this, though. The um, What I find uh, remarkable is that nobody seems to remember that Cheney openly lied that we ever waterboarded anybody for years. And now he's very publicly saying, well, well there's terrorists. It doesn't count. Or, you know, or there are enemy combatants, and we were trying to save American lives. And it's almost like it's a given that the whole legal question is irrelevant to everybody, you know? Well, in fact, I was going to say, what about Al Libby, who they, I think, uh, McClatchy showed that the the torture went up in frequency uh, right around the time they were trying to get Al Libby and a few others, uh, 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 good old, what's his name, Zabeda, to point the finger at Saddam Hussein for training al-Qaeda in chemical weapons, and then right after the Iraq war, when they were trying again to get al-Qaeda detainees to point the finger at Saddam Hussein. That, that was, I think, McClatchy's headline even was like, hey, it's pretty sure, it's pretty clear the correlation here, that they were torturing people to get incriminating information about Saddam Hussein. Right, but, but the, I think the biggest problem here is that everything is being presented as somehow fair, and balance when things aren't fair and balanced. Facts are facts. They don't take a side. The earth is round. I'm sorry. It's not flat. You can you can have your whole flat camp, but that doesn't make it fact. You know? And so you have, we are signatories to the Geneva Conventions We and various other United Nations um, uh, covenants against torture and human rights abuses. What was done is illegal. There's no debating that. And yet, the debate is not about whether it's illegal or not, but if it saved American lives. You know, it's a war crime to invade a country, a sovereign nation, without provocation. No one's talking about that, right? They're talking about, well, but Saddam Hussein may have attacked us on 9-11, uh, and there's no evidence for this. Okay, well, it's not that. Okay, well, we, we wanted to bring democracy, but it's illegal. Everything's become as, as though you have one expert and another, and there's, they each have an opinion, and there's no fact that everything is equal, and it's not. Yeah, especially on the torture debate. I mean, I think that's that's I mean, a yeah, really I, important you know, part of this, where they can just basically, you know, in fact, uh, that John Stewart interview, the guy said, uh, Mark Thiessen. Yeah, yeah, Mark, Mark Thiessen, exactly. Um, John Stewart asked him, "Well, wait a minute. If Al Qaeda captured one of our guys and waterboarded him, you're saying right. that would be okay?" And he said. No, because they're not signatories to the Geneva Conventions. It's okay for us to torture them, but not for them to torture us. And, uh, of course, I've, according to the other Scott Horton, who's an actual human rights lawyer and knows all about this stuff for a fact, he says the way the Geneva Conventions are written, it has nothing yeah. to do with the captives. It's all about you. If, you, if, you, if, if the U.S. government is a signatory, then right. it binds our behavior in the way we treat detainees. It doesn't matter whether That's they're right. signatories or not. That's right. And in fact, even the Bush administration had abandoned the argument uh, that um, it was all about whether they were irregulars and, and all that uh, years ago. So, right. But anyway, this is what I'm saying. On. No one is, you know, interested. And I'm talking about legitimate news outlets and pointing out in calling a calling things by their proper name. Torture is torture. You can you can call it really pretty things like uh, enhanced interrogation, but it doesn't change what it is. Um, so, A, not calling things by their proper names, and B, um, putting everything on equal footing, fact and opinion on equal footing. And as a result, I, you know, if, if you want to talk about who lied or who's the most responsible for the Iraq war and, uh, you know, and all of the stuff that's gone on, 
the blame falls squarely on the shoulders of the, of the fourth estate because they are the ones who are responsible for telling us the truth. Or I should say, we are responsible for telling the people the truth. You know, yeah. you expect politicians to lie. Well, you know, the problem is here, though, is especially when it's the Iraq war, is this yeah. was a lie that so many people in the media were in on that really, unless you're from anti-war or raw story or Knight Ritter, now McClatchy newspapers, yeah. you have to admit that it's your fault that those million people are dead. If if you were a New York Times reporter or a Washington Post or a Dallas Morning News or a L.A. Times or a Chicago Tribune reporter and you right. pretended like, well, gee, we know he's making nuclear weapons, we got to do something, then how are you supposed to call the administration out when you were the one? So they all just pat each other on the back and continue well, it's like, on. It's mutual blackmail. They right. all lie to each other. and Or, you know, look at Judith Miller. She gets fired. That's. You know, she goes to jail and people cry for her. When how many people are dead because of her articles? Because they were lies and everyone knew they were lies, including her own editors, the staff at the New York Times that I talked to. People knew. And, it, you know, but it, 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 you know, it gave access to, to the Bush White House and that was enough. Access was enough to justify this. So, you know, I think we've gone off on 10 million tangents, but no, I think that's good to put some put some tough media criticism at the end of this whole thing because after all, I mean, like you say, let's go back to remember the feeling, how it was, what was the the common zeitgeist in the society or whatever in 2002. You know, something's got to be done about this Saddam. Let's all pretend that we all believe in this. Let's all. And, you know, this is something that Charles Goyette says is that, you know, and he got fired. He lost his job as a radio show host at the time for standing by his principles. And he said, yeah. you know, the reason that there's really no comeuppance and no responsibility and the law is not being enforced and whatever is because the American people are just as guilty as David Gregory and Scooter Libby. That well, no, the American people to... wanted blood and bombing Afghanistan was not enough. We wanted to bomb something that had actually been built before and instead of just rocks. We wanted to kill more people. Really, I think that's simplistic. I think the American public, the majority of this, you know, I'm not talking about the, the teabaggers. And their crazy uh, notion that, you know, there, there's some socialist conspiracy and all Muslims are terrorists and all liberals are with the terrorists and all this other garbage. Uh, I'm talking about uh, most reasonable people believed what they were being told on the news, that Saddam Hussein was involved in the attacks on this country. So, yes, they wanted blood, but it seemed justified. I mean, you, you know, re revenge is never justified, but... The point I'm making is you're making it very simplistic. The public was misled. I don't know if you can actively blame the public. Now, with everything out, and as so many people know enough now, the fact that there's pressure to prosecute them is where the public is should be held accountable. But in the build-up to the Iraq War, I don't think the public can be held accountable for believing not only in uh, the government and but let's put that aside. Believing in the, in in the press that the press would tell us the truth, I just think it's 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 very simplistic to to put it on the shoulders of the of the public in the build up to the war. What about when seventy one percent believe that Iran has the bomb right now, and it's the same bogus lie seven years later? Are we responsible? We are the American seventy one percent responsible for believing bogus lies about Iran this moment? Well, you know, Iran is more complicated than Iraq. Iraq, as simple as it was, it was still, still the facts were so convoluted, and we were lied to to such an extent that that when you look at Iran, Iran is far more complicated because you, in fact, do have an energy program there. So there's some smoke where they claim there's fire. The public isn't, you know, the majority of the public isn't, some isn't capable of this kind of nuanced thinking you know for them it's oh they have an energy program equals they have the bomb so it, it's more complicated with iran but and i don't expect the, the majority of the public to understand mm -hmm. well you but know i'm not what trying the to news media is for it's supposed to tell us this is what the facts are and opinion writers are supposed to in fact be able to support their opinions, not just write propaganda. 
you know, it used to be that if you, if you, you know, you, you wrote your opinion, but it was an outright lie, you know, it, you didn't write again. Yeah, no, I'm with you, and I'm not trying to uh, acquit the people who did wrong with their authority, and that goes from, you know, the Sunday morning news shows to the vice president's office and everywhere in between. Uh, but the cool thing about responsibility to me is is I can divide up massive portions of it way beyond adding up to 100% because it's just kind of a make-believe concept anyway. And so, Wait, what, whoa, 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 whoa. what's a make-believe concept? You're, you're way ahead of me. Well, responsibility, it's sort of an abstract thing, so I think I can blame the people who wanted to believe in the lies about Iraq just as much as the people who were lying to them and give them all 100% responsibility. I don't think that, that blaming one side acquits the other is what I'm trying to say. No, if, if one side relies on the other for information, then you can't blame the people for getting faulty information. As I said, you can hold the public accountable after the fact because now we know. We know that they tortured, okay? And Dick Cheney, is, and, and, and he's doing this on Fox News, so the Fox News viewers know. He's going around saying, yeah, okay, we waterboarded, blah, blah. We were saving American lives. It's, so we now know that we violated the law, that, that he committed war crimes. This is now known. And people choosing to still say, well, that's okay because we're Americans and so we're special in some way, um, and we're allowed to do these things. Um, now you can say, okay, now the public can be held accountable because they know and they're still standing behind this. But yeah. as there's a buildup to the war, and, you know, it's not like the public is seeing classified information firsthand. They're relying on media accounts. And you also have to remember that the Bush administration was absolutely uh, aggressively engaging in fear-mongering. There were orange alerts and red alerts and blue alerts, uh, you name it. Every other day there was an alert, there was a, uh, you know, a terrorist attack coming, they were about to kill us all. I don't know if you remember the level of panic they were trying to uh, instill in the public. I absolutely do. And the thing is, um, well, I'm glad we're talking about this. I'm not sure how useful it is to other people, but it's very interesting to me. Because, see, my thing was I was driving a cab at the time. So I was able to talk with people who just weren't interested in the facts at all. They wanted to kill those people. They would bend over backwards to say, well, the president knows, and, and we'll just go in there and get Saddam and get out. And the U.N. sucks because they're not proactive enough. We have to do this. And at the same time, 10,000-something people came out to protest in Austin, Texas. You know, and they the knew better. Cover it. They and knew the news better. didn't cover it. Well, the I know the news didn't, didn't but I'm just saying if that many people knew better, then no one else has an excuse. That's not true. You're talking about people of different access to information, different intelligence, different education. And what I'm saying is, what do you think, that this, these people you talked to woke up one morning and latched on to Iraq or Saddam on their own? No. That was put into their heads. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, hey, I mean, obviously, this whole thing is Dick Cheney's responsibility. If it's got to yeah. go on one person, it's him. But absolutely, I would know. say. Well, and I would say George Bush for allowing, for be, for having the hubris to think that he could be president, and then being president and refusing to acknowledge that he made mistakes. He deserves the blame too. Whether he lied or not is irrelevant. What is, you know, important here is that he knows now. He's out of that bubble. And to not come forward and say, you know, I made mistakes, I listened to the wrong people, blah, blah, blah. He has yet to do that. He has yet to apologize. And as far as I'm concerned, he now is as guilty as though, you know, it, as if he didn't willfully and knowingly lie. So, yeah, it rests with them. And it, But, if, you know, you expect politicians to be crooked, you, but you don't expect the, the press to be crooked. You expect them to take risks to protect sources, to go to jail for their sources in order to tell you the truth, you know? Well, and as we've talked about, there was enough good reporting to yeah. contrast against the bad reporting from from back then. I mean, again, I'll mention the guys at, at what was then Knight Ritter, uh, who right. now all worked for McClatchy, but especially uh, Lande and Strobel. I mean, these guys debunked every bit of this before the war. And, and they're sure, news reporters. People... They weren't debunkers. They weren't uh, opinion writers. They were reporters. And they were just saying, look, we're talking to our CIA contacts, and they're saying this is all a bunch of bunk. And they were called liars because, well, if the Washington Post and the New York Times don't have it, these guys are lying. You know? Yep. They're not credible. And the fact that they were able to stay on the story, I think, is credit to the editors at 
the class here tonight or, or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Because anywhere else, they, they would have been pulled off the story because nobody else was able to verify or unwilling to verify what they were writing about. Uh, that's uh, everybody. That's Larissa Alexandrovna, managing editor of Investigative News at RawStory.com. Appreciate it. Uh huh. Bye. Oh yeah, and everybody check out the Path of War timeline at RawStory.com as well.